the decision to make Bridie into a motion picture came suddenly. And lots of people said, really, it started in a bookstore. My wife Betty was looking for a book that our three boys would enjoy on a vacation to Florida. She ended up buying Bridie of the Grand Canyon by Marguerite Henry. I'd never heard of Marguerite, but I later found out she'd written dozens of horse books, and eventually she wrote one about a burrow. It had been 10 years since the book had been published, but we'd never heard of it. So from that book, we went on the vacation, and I started to read it just out of curiosity, and I ended up reading the whole book to the whole family aloud. It was such a fascinating book, and it was so well in illustrated that being a filmmaker myself already, but with no major productions behind me, I thought, this is the one we're going to do. And from there, two years of pre-production work and getting the rights first from Rand McNally and from the author, then signing contracts, scouting locations. All that took over two years, and that's part of the reason for the success of the film, because shooting in such a difficult location and doing difficult scenes required everything to be worked out ahead of time. We couldn't invent things as we went along. So that's how the story got, got into film. And uh, three years after I first saw the book, it was released. Marguerite Henry's book involves an animal in almost every scene. So the burrow that plays Brady was extremely important. She did years of research before she finished the book. She ended up buying a burrow in her area in Illinois, which is horse country west of Chicago. And she studied the burrow and what it did and what funny things it did. And she integrated all those things that the burrow liked to do into the story. Her research at the Grand Canyon turned out to be wonderfully revealing because there was a real family operating on the North Rim a tourist business for the few tourists that came to the North Rim in those days. And they had a burrow. And that was, there was a real Brighty. So we're talking about a real story that happened in the early days of the 20th century. Brighty first came there just before 1900 and was there until he died at the age of about 30. He came with a prospector from Flagstaff, which is south of the South Rim, about 70 miles, and then went, was taken down into the canyon and spent several years there. Eventually, he ended up on the North Rim at the Wiley Camp, which is part of the story of Brady that Marguerite Henry wrote, and it's all true. The interesting thing about what Marguerite learned about the family with the burrow that had Brighty in his later years hauling water from a spring down below the rim is that she figured with a family operation there ought to be a boy there that was f close friends with Brighty. But she couldn't find any record of a boy, so she dreamed one up, and much later after the book was out, she got a letter from a man in California who had lived at the canyon, who was part of the family, and he was the boy. So the name is different than the real person, but there really was a boy. And in the film, of course, it's played by Dandy Curran, a young man from, from uh, Phoenix who we cast. Norman Foster was selected as director of Brighty, mainly because of his experience working with Walt Disney. Besides uh, being the director 
of the Davy Crockett series. He did parts of El Fago Baca for TV, for Disney, and, and some of the other shows. And he was used to working on locations. Well, the Grand Canyon is a bad one. And Norman had been there many times. He had lived with the Navajos for a while. And he just knew the countryside, and he knew how to deal with animals. So when we decided Norman was it, his first job was to write the screenplay. And I, gave, I had already done a screenplay myself, spent a couple of months previously working on it after I had visited the canyon two different times. But he said, I'm going to just start over, and I let him go at it. And every couple of weeks, I flew to California, and we went over the script and spent several days working on it together. So Norman did the screenplay, and Marguerite Henry had supplied all the interesting historical information on the canyon so that we couldn't go wrong. When casting began, Norman was in charge, and I was there to give my approval to. And we cast all the, uh, all the human roles, except about two, sitting in Norman's house in Beverly Hills uh, and listening to readings by various known and unknown actors in the Hollywood area. For the boy in the picture, we decided, I think Norman had decided, the best place to find him was in Arizona at Phoenix. So we flew to Phoenix, had a casting call there, and after about five hours of listening to various kids, we picked Dandy Curran, who lived in Phoenix and was, is the son of a former Miss America, Jackie Mercer. Uh, now we had the boy. We still hadn't cast the lead role completely. We, we were looking further. But right up to the time production started, Norman was pulling together the cast. And the last one cast was Joseph Cotton, who came directly to the canyon from San Francisco, where he was working at the time on something. He was there for some reason. And he had an awful time getting to the canyon. He had to take a train, and then he had to take a bus, and then he had to take an airplane. And he finally got to our location north of the Grand Canyon at Kanab, Utah. The most important actor in the film, Brighty, was also one of the last cast. We had hunted through Arizona for burrows that looked like they could play the part. We went to an Indian reservation, and it just seemed impossible to have any of these animals star in the film and appear in almost every scene. So in conversations with the author, Marguerite Henry, about the difficulty of casting, she said, well, what about my burrow? She had named it Jigs, and that's the borough that she studied when she was writing the book 10 years earlier. So I flew to Chicago, drove over to uh, her house out in the horse country, which she called Mole Meadow, and met Jigs, who became the star of our film. A neighbor boy had started teaching tricks to Jigs, and so the, this particular burrow was already used to obeying some commands, and that proved invaluable. So what happened, the young boy that had had the animal, thanks to Marguerite Henry, for many years on loan, was now an adult and was really interested in the Wild West. His nickname was even Tex. And he drove that burrow to the Grand Canyon, to our locations, 
and sort of help the handler in our crew learn how to make Bridie do tricks. So that in that way, Marguerite saved the day again, not just with her research, but with her own burrow. Of course, we had stand-ins for the tough scenes, but her burrow did most of the work. Working with animals in film is always difficult, but we managed to get through with the star that played Brighty and his stand-ins. The other miscellaneous animals were easy. They were brought by an animal trainer from Hollywood. The cougars in the film were both trained and wild. A trainer brought a well-trained cougar complete with fangs and all its claws to do a scene that we felt was one of the most difficult, and that is when Brighty, standing below a cliff, is attacked by a cougar that leaps off the cliff above and lands on his back and chews on his neck during a lion hunt. Here's the shot, but it doesn't show all the difficulties we encountered doing this. And the, uh, the trainer of the, this particular cougar and one of the men that captured the wild lions for the hunt scenes actually tossed this cougar off the cliff. And the cougar landed on Brady's pack saddle. Each time we did a take, this mountain lion tried to run away. And the, tra the trainer couldn't go chase it. He's up on the cliff. So it was the duty of the prop man and the rest of us standing around to grab the, this full-grown cougar. Well, the prop man was fastest on his feet. And it was really something to see him when he finally got brave after the first couple of takes. He just ran after that cougar and grabbed the tail and dug his heels in and brought that cat to a halt. Well, our work in the Grand Canyon would have been impossible without a helicopter. And we knew that from the start after a couple of trips there. And so we ended up getting a Hughes 300, which is only a three-passenger ship. And we found a pilot that was unbelievable. He flew so many trips to the bottom of the Grand Canyon just on ordinary errands like taking in food for lunch and uh, taking me to scout locations and just all the things you can't do by mule, which is the only other means of transportation in the Grand Canyon. He flew over 1,200 round trips to the bottom of the canyon and back in various spots. 35 a day for three solid months. So while we were there, he became the most experienced helicopter pilot at the Grand Canyon. So that's what we did every day we were in the canyon. We also used the copter for errands in other ways hunting further locations, going down river to start construction of the tramway across the river, taking the construction crew in there and moving them out. All the actors in the film came down from the south rim or the north rim later on in production. And we just, uh, we used the helicopter only as a way of moving where we couldn't take the time to use, every, use the mule trains, the helicopter did the work. Every step of the way during the production of Brady, we were working closely with the Park Service. Partway through the filming, the route our helicopter had been taking over the rim of the canyon near the hotels bothered some of the guests, and one of them wrote a letter back to the canyon saying it spoiled his visit down in the canyon. So as a result of that, the Park Service says you've got to go a longer route 
farther east on the canyon before you can drop down into the canyon. Same for coming out of the canyon with the helicopter. So every step, we worked with the park superintendent who was enthusiastic about the film and wanted to do everything he could to see its completion, yet he didn't want to spoil the vacations of all those people that come there throughout the year. And we were shooting there in the probably the height of the season, starting at the South Rim in uh, May and working to the North Rim in June, the middle of June, when the last snow occurred and the plows that had been working for, through 70 miles of 10-foot deep snow, it had taken them 30 days to get to the hotels on the North Rim. Then we moved to the North Rim. So everything depended on the Park Service. We couldn't shoot at the North Rim until it was open. And then we had to uh, do it as quickly as possible. But they were very cooperative. And I doubt that a film crew would be allowed in the canyon today because there are too many visitors. There are already too many sightseeing planes. And they probably just wouldn't allow this to happen. But the story of Brighty, of the real Brighty, was so closely tied with the canyon that it was to their benefit to cooperate and see the film through. Construction of the uh, cable tramway over the Colorado River at a place where it was 400 feet wide across rapids was one of the most difficult projects involved in preparing to shoot Brady. And aside from the helicopter, which was invaluable, we had to find a land access to the place where the cable was strung across. And what we did was to build a, there was a creek at the foot of Bright Angel Trail that was closest to where we built the uh, cable train. But to get the crew and the equipment, the mules and everything across that creek, it was too deep because it was right next to the Colorado River where it emptied out. So what we did, we put our heads together and decided we've got to build a floating bridge. Now who's going to build the floating bridge? Well, you don't build it when you're shooting. So the producer gets called. So after the supplies had been hauled down by a large Bell G2B helicopter that was working on a canyon freshwater pipeline, Marvin Adams, our head grip, and I went down to do the construction. He brought the tools and I banged my hammer and I tied rope and we lashed a whole bunch of 55 gallon drums together and built a path across out of lumber so that the 35 mules and the people, the cast of six, and all the others that were needed could go to the tram site. Once that bridge was built, there was an existing narrow trail that went right where the construction was taking place. The original cable tram took the place of a rope strung across the Colorado with a boat that you could pull yourself across in. That was in the early part of the 20th century or late 1800s. Then later, a cable tram took its place near the site of the rope. And that's where all the trails sort of merge down at the bottom of the canyon now. The, the Kaibab Trail comes down there. The Bright Angel Trail meets it. They both cross at that point in the river, but it's on a bridge now. And then they go to Phantom Ranch and up toward the North Rim. The uh, cable tram, we found the old eye bolts from the original cable tram, but they were right next to the bridge, so we couldn't use that site because it, it would be difficult for photography and it would show things that didn't exist at the time uh, that cable tram was there. 
So when we got the crew in to build the, build the tram, we had to get the crew, the rest of the crew for the shooting over, and we built that bridge. Then the helicopter dropped in lumber on a sandbar on the other end of the cable strung across the river. And the crew built a helicopter pad out of wood, raised up about three feet above the sand so the copter didn't stir up quite as much sand each time it landed. The burrow that played Brighty in these scenes, some was the star and some were a stand-in, but the burrow that went across to the north side of the river in the tram was the stand-in. And how did that burrow get there? In the tram that was built. It had a uh, power-operated cable system rather than the hand cable system that existed way back. We got the burrow across. The cable at the north side was about 30 feet high above some rocks, so you got out of the uh, end of the cable tram at a high level. Then the burrow was led down to the sandbar. And the, the burrow could not get out of that site so while the shooting was going on each day, that burrow spent the nights there all alone. There's no way a human being or a burrow could get out of the Grand Canyon at that point. Absolutely none, even though burrows are good climbers in rocks. So we got the tramway operating. We had the helicopter pad built. Now we're ready to shoot. Only one thing is missing. One scene calls for the burrow to panic and kick the end out of the tramway cage and to uh, eventually backs up and falls into the Colorado River. Well, we're not going to let that really happen. So another Sunday down at the canyon, Marv and I re-rigged the uh, pulleys that hang the cage from the cable so that we could lower the cage. We put new block, put extra blocks, blocks in there on the cable so we could lower this heavy cage that's built of steel and wood down to the sandbar next to the river so that we could have the cage at low altitude and the burrow could fall out into the sand. And the cameras a hole was dug in the sand, so the, the, the uh, big camera and one of the crew members are down in a hole two and a half or three feet deep in the sand, looking up using a wide-angle lens. We weakened the boards, cut them partway through on the end of the cage, so the end opened up, and then we all stood by and watched. And the the effect was perfect. The burrow fell out. The burrow wasn't hurt. And then we raised the cage back up to its normal level. But the construction of all this, the cable tram itself took five weeks just to get the cable strung across. First, a light rope was taken across by a helicopter, then a heavier rope, then a cable. And eventually a cable, I, I'm guessing, about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half in diameter. One of the problems that we had to overcome doing Brighty was to find a log cabin that was like Uncle Jimmy Owens, the lion hunter's cabin. Jack Church, who was my location manager, and he's the one who has had, at that time, had all the mules at the north rim of the Grand Canyon for the tourists to ride, and all the mules at Zion National Park, and all the mules at Bryce Canyon Park, he had four or 500 mules. Jack was my right-hand man during the whole production. He got things that we needed. He found burrow stand-ins. He found more mules when we need, needed more for our crew and he helped me find a cabin. One day, during my second visit to the canyon during pre-production planning, 
We drove 250 miles of back roads on the north rim of the Grand Canyon hunting for a cabin. That is a long distance. It was not in a four-wheel drive vehicle. It was a Chevy pickup truck. But we made it through all those miles, and we found some decrepit old cabins, but none that were perfect. So he continued to search. And eventually, he found a cabin that he salvaged all the logs, rebuilt it exactly that same way, way up near the top of Cedar Mountain in Utah, about a hundred and... Uh, well, about a hundred miles north of the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And he built the cabin while the weather was good in the fall, and then let it, we let it get snowed in. And our start date for shooting was in mid-April the following year. And so by then, there was 10 feet of snow on the ground. The roads were plowed, but not to the cabin. We had to use snowshoes and a snowmobile. And it was an early snowmobile, not like the kind we're used to now. And Brady had to struggle through that snow. And I remember leading him to the cabin from the road. And I had snowshoes on, and Brady weighs, weighed 400 pounds, or at least, I think it's 400 pounds. And so every once in a while, he'd break through the crust and sink down and it would take several wranglers and I to get him back up onto the crust of the snow and continue on another 100 or 200 feet to the cabin. Why didn't Walt Disney do this film? It's a natural for him. I thought it was. I couldn't believe he wasn't doing it. I had been acquainted with him for a few years, corresponding with him a lot on our mutual hobby of live steam railroad trains. Walt had a railroad in his backyard that was fantastic, and I had seen it in 1951. So when I got interested in Brighty, I couldn't, I thought I better contact Walt. He probably owns the rights. Turned out he didn't. He had read the book, decided it had some limitations that he didn't want to deal with. And so basically he said he wasn't interested in distributing or having anything to do with the film at that point. Surprisingly, many years later, just before, a few months before we actually started shooting, a friend of mine married to a cousin of, of mine in Michigan and they had visited Smoke Tree Ranch in Palm Springs, where a lot of movie stars have homes. And Gordon got back from that vacation and got in touch with me. And he says, you'll never guess what happened. I was in line in, for dinner with Walt Disney. And I mentioned to him that Steve Booth is doing Brighty as a movie. He says, what do you mean Steve Booth is doing Brighty as a movie? I own the movie rights to that book. And Gordon says, no, you don't. So he was really surprised. I guess somewhere along the line, he got it in his mind that he owned the rights. So I corresponded with Walt afterwards, uh, thinking maybe he'd be interested in distributing the film, but that didn't ever work out. He had been, had tried that with another producer on some film, and he had bad results, so he wasn't willing to take a chance. But I thought it was funny that he thought he owned the rights, and I was all ready to shoot. Looking back on the production of Brady, I can't help but think what amazing things we did with a low budget, extremely difficult locations, it was fun when we were there. It's been difficult all along the way, especially distribution. I think one of the biggest difficulties was that we didn't get more money from the distributor initially to help pay off some of the bills. And because we were tight on money and didn't want a large print bill from having many, many prints for all the theaters, we limited it to 50 
prints, so there were only 50 theaters that could show it at one time. Nowadays, movies are in thousands of theaters right from the start. So that was a mistake, too. But all in all, it was a great experience. And I don't regret one minute of it. <laughs>